All right, so the, uh, the next speaker is the, uh, the Heather Wade, who is talking about why NBS proving the epoch of reorganization with the brightest distant LAEs. Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Heather Wade and I am a second year PhD student at Lancaster University in the UK and um, being supervised by Dr. David Sabral. Mm -hmm. Today I'll be talking to you about how we search for the brightest distant Lyman alpha emitters in the cosmos field, probing into the epoch of reionization um, using narrowband data taken with the VLT um, and the Hawkeye instrument uh, in the hopes of populating the bright end of the redshift 7.7 Lyman alpha luminosity function. As we all know, the epoch of ionization marks the last major phase transition of hydrogen and is a mysterious and fascinating realm in the very early universe. However, there are still plenty of open questions about reionization. How did the process of reionization develop? What are the start and end points of reionization? What are the sources of reionization and what can we learn about these sources? So one model, patchy reionization, suggests that the brightest sources dominate the process. And evidence for patchy reionization can be seen when we observe galaxies and quasars through different lines of sight and see different levels of ionization. At the same redshifts, some fields can be fully ionized, whereas others can be fully neutral, suggesting a patchy process. So the exact relative contribution to cosmic reionization from massive stars and AGN are still unknown, as are the contributions from the many faint galaxies and from the rarer but brighter galaxies. And it's these bright galaxies that are thought to dominate the process. So in order to observe these brighter sources inside the epoch of reionization, we turn to the Lyman Alpha emission line. So many large surveys such as Lager, Dawn and SC4K have yielded um, great results by finding Lyman alpha emitters through various redshifts. For example, in Sabral et al. 2018, they observed 4,000 Lyman alpha emitters between redshift two and six, and they find minimal evolution in the luminosity function, which is a key result for us to understand when we dig for Lyman alpha emitters above redshift seven and observe how reionization affects the observability of galaxies here. But to even observe them in the first place, these bright galaxies need to be inside ionized bubbles that are large enough for the Lyman alpha emission line to be redshifted out of them, like this diagram shows. And this means that we can calculate the size of ionization bubbles. For example, the galaxy Kola 1, thought to be at redshift 6.59, has been calculated um, to require a bubble with radius 300 kiloparsecs to be observed. And um, so this project, um, the results from this project will shed light on the size of ionization bubbles that were possible at Russia 7.7 by finding new galaxies here, following in the footsteps of Eshetal 2015, for example, where they spectroscopically confirmed a galaxy at Russia 7.73. So in order um, to use the Lyman alpha emission line to find high redshift galaxies, uh, narrowband surveys are carried out. And if your narrowband filter covers the redshifted Lyman alpha wavelength, um, you will see a transmission excess in the narrowband compared to a broadband filter at a similar wavelength. And you'll see your narrowband um, light up like this diagram shows. So a certain amount of progress has already been made um, in this field with narrowband surveys discovering Lyman alpha emitters above redshift six, um, which is shown here but this plot is very busy. So let's break down this evolution a little bit first. So here we are seeing the Lyman alpha luminosity function at redshift 5.7 and 6.6. .6, and this Schechter fit is well established with plenty of confirmed Lyman alpha emitters above the bright and the faint ends. As I said earlier, the um, we observe minimal evolution up to redshift six. Um, and above redshift six, we expect that the amount of neutral hydrogen in the universe will mean that the fainter sources are no longer visible, which we see here with this drop in the luminosity function at redshift 6.6. .6. The observed differences in the faint ends is possibly um, evidence of patchy reionization, as we would expect the real number densities of these two redshifts to be similar. Um, but we miss the faint sources as they can only be observed if they are inside the ionized bubble of a brighter source. So as we move to redshift 6.6, .6, we see a very different picture of the universe. 
These blue stars are um, showing the exciting new results from the Lager survey, World et al. 2021, which has observed the largest area of register 6.9 so far. Uh, this survey covered multiple fields and they observed significant cosmic variance between them. For example, they found an excess of sources in the cosmos field compared to other fields observed, um, showing that a more ionized field uh, shows a higher number of observed Lyman alpha sources. So this shows that the picture is far more complicated than us just being able to observe bright sources with faint sources disappearing in their clouds of neutral hydrogen. So more work must be done to interpret this, to overcome cosmic variance and to push this to higher redshifts. So now as we delve above redshift seven and further into the epoch of reionization, the Lyman alpha luminosity function is even less established with far fewer confirmed sources and there is no consistency between studies or um, observed fields. So it seems like the faint end is once again getting pushed down like we saw between redshift um, 5.7 and 6.6, um, but there's not enough data at the bright end to fully understand any evolution here. So there are two confirmed sources, a redshift 7.7 .7, um, from Tilvi et al. Um, 2020 in orange, and our work aims to find more of these bright Lyman alpha emitters at redshift 7.7 .7 to further populate the bright end of the Lyman alpha luminosity function or at the very least, place um, some good constraints on it and use these to plan future wide, deep narrowband surveys. So these green lines represent the luminosities and volumes probed by the YMBS survey to find redshift 7.7 .7 Lyman alpha emitters. Um, the data for this work, the YMBS survey, was collected during a 44 hour observing run of the Cosmos field using Hawkeye on the VLT. The filter used was NB1060, making this a near-infrared narrowband survey. Um, we observe a total of 69 pointings in the cosmos field, with some deeper and some shallower, covering around one degree squared, with the survey designed to overlap with the deepest ultra-vista stripes. So we decided to reduce the data ourselves with a dedicated pipeline um, to get the best possible quality of data. And then to extend our search for redshift 7.7 .7 Lyman alpha emitters, we include um, archive data for the Good South field, which was also collected with Hawkeye. Um, so this single pointing is significantly deeper than the Cosmos data with around 31 hours of exposure time in just this one pointing. So I don't have time to discuss the um, Lyman uh, li line emitter selection process, um, but we follow the methods of many other similar surveys, um, which includes cross-matching to catalogues of known photometric redshift values. Um, so due to the nature of the surveys, our sample is dominated by lower redshift sources, um, but we can select these uh, redshift 0.6 H-alpha emitters and calculate a preliminary luminosity function. So despite further work yet to be done here, green is comparable to other which are news. Um, studying these lower redshift galaxies is still very useful in order to better understand galaxy evolution. And this work will hopefully be coming to an archive near you in the next few months. So um, back to Lyman alpha emitters in the epoch of reionization. Uh, here in this ZJH color color diagram, we exclude any sources with a redshift value below three, and we highlight the approximate area where we'd expect to see Lyman break galaxies at around redshift eight. So once we apply the um, Z-band limiting magnitude, shown as these purple squares, uh, we can see several sources here. After the visual X, we find that we pretend to Lyman as a very preliminary result on the redshift 7.7 .7, uh, Lyman alpha luminosity function here in black. Um, so there's still plenty of work left to do here, um, but hopefully we can continue to better understand the trends in the redshift 7.7 .7 Lyman alpha luminosity function. So we can uh, learn about the epoch of ionization and the size of ionized bubbles that these sources produce. So look out for a paper with the final results of this um, soonish. 
Important future work in this field requires surveys across multiple fields to reach wide areas and overcome the field to field variance and to observe the bright end of the Lyman alpha luminosity function accurately. This intermediate luminosity region at redshift 7.7 is also yet to be fully studied and constrained despite, the, um, despite it being possible with current telescopes. Um, a large sample through all luminosities is needed, and it is also especially important to follow up and confirm any sources that are found. Um, the Lyman alpha luminosity function of shift 8 is also um, unknown, and future technologies will hopefully probe this as well in the coming years. So I'll just leave you with the summary slide, say thank you for listening, and um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Right, thank you, Heather. So, time for questions. So now we are waiting for the 10-20 uh, seconds for people to write up uh, their questions. Uh, do the errors on your luminosity function point uh, include cosmic variance and do you expect cosmic variance to be important? Um, yeah, we definitely expect it to be important. So this is um, the area we have uh, in the full cosmic, uh, cosmos field. So already um, the volume is not um, super high. We'd need lots of different um, fields with high areas to overcome that. This is just a, a, a starting point, basically. Right, so uh, we got the question from Rebecca Bowler. Uh, do the errors on your luminosity function point in, oh yeah, this is the same. Yeah, okay. I, I asked that one. <laughs> oh, it's the same, okay, all right. Great, so any anything else? Oh yeah, Yuichi Harikane uh, asked a question. What does the other uh, UV magnitude of these sources are they UV bright? Um, so these two that we found here um, are very preliminary. So off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, but that is definitely something that we would um, look into and conf well try and confirm whether these are redshift 7.7 .7 Lyman alpha emitters um, first. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I think the other time is the other running up. So yeah, all right. So uh, yeah, let's thank Heather again.